Welcome back to the Q&A and this is part six. And this is take two of part six. Why take two? Because I did something with the cable. I'm not gonna touch anything right now. Hopefully everything is recording correctly, just in case. I put some oil in there. My backup, this is my uh, feedback critique microphone. So I got two things recording as a backup. Anyway, if you're new to this, hi, my name is JD and I do sometimes Q&As. It's been a long time. Usually I do uh, animation lectures, I do product reviews, review reviews, I do animation feedback stuff, animation analysis clips, I do uh, all kinds of stuff, I don't know. So that's kind of the pitch at the beginning. So feel free to browse around the channel and look around. If you like it, subscribe so you don't miss any of those uploads. If you don't like it, don't subscribe. Maybe you wanna watch this and maybe you're convinced later on. Who knows, but this is how this works. Now the Q&A is a bit different. Q&As are usually just me rambling for half an hour, an hour. Uh, usually minimal edits unless I cough or I do things that need some edits. But it's usually I read the questions just in case you are only listening to those Q&As. You can just hear the questions and then I talk about it. And that is that. Um, got a bunch of questions, actually a lot today. I have 16, it's not 16 questions, 16 screenshots of multiple questions. So it's going to be packed. And uh, why wait? So let's start. And question number one is really long. So... As always, and read the whole thing. Bear with me. I have the same question as Eric Malako. Now, this has been five, I mean, since 11 months, but since the last Q&A recording uh, for the answers, I think five months. Apologize for the uh, long break in between. I got really busy. Um, and I don't remember what the question was that Eric had. He says, here's the same question, so it must be something similar, just for context, whatever. I'm learning Maya and 3D animation by myself. Your channel really helps me to learn more about 3D animation. Thank you, that's awesome. Although I was 2D game animator, I quit my job and decided to switch to 3D because I really want to work in AAA game, game companies. I am practicing every day. Sometimes I feel lost and I ask myself, am I on the right track? Is there any specific exercises like a list or something that newbie animators start with them? Yes, there is a list. I'm going to put that in the description. It's a classic 51 exercises that animators can do. I think that was somewhat kind of the paraphrasing title, but a really long list, really, really cool. Um, I would start with that generally my answer would be whatever you do do anything that helps you with body mechanics because you can always build on top of that and then add your whatever you need action fights dance acting performance whatever you have but if your body mechanics are not not on track in terms of just being really solid and believable you're gonna have problems also problems i just have banana bread <laughs> for some reason i'm just a lot of saliva <laughs> there'll be a lot of swelling and his Q name is very weird. ASMR. I'm very close to this microphone as well here. But anyway, I would definitely concentrate on body mechanics first. So if you start brand new, bouncing balls, um, pendulum, that type of stuff, the, the classic building blocks, you build on top of that to make it more complicated. You got a ball with a tail, squash and stretch to the ball. The ball can be alive and not physics driven, it's more character driven and so on. But definitely go with weight, weight shifts, jumps, sit downs, just anything mechanics wise, human two creatures can only be super helpful. Sometimes I really don't know what to do. I stop my practice and start overthinking and asking myself, no, no, maybe I should try body mechanic, yes. Or no, maybe I should make some acting animations. And sorry for a very long comment, but I'm about to explode and I need help. Right, and at the same reaction that I had uh, last week, and uh, since my brain, clearly I don't remember anything, but the same reaction again, I uh, I'm, uh, I apologize for this really late answer since he's about to explode. I hope Nilufar, that's your new name, Nilufar, um, you're okay. Hope you found answers. I feel like I'm really, really bad. This is a really long uh, reply, or it's been a long time since uh, you heard from me. So I hope everything's okay. If you're still watching the channel, um, let me know in the comments. What did you find out? Um, again, reiterating, I think anything animation wise that you're going to do will be helpful. Even if it's, you're not solid in body mechanics, but you're going to do acting clips right now. It's still practice for something. You know what I mean? It's like, to me, like anything, even now, if you, if I go back to bouncing ball for students or a little demo, it's just a lot of fun. It just, and it's, it's so less complex than humans or creatures, but it still reinforces weight and timing. It's just, I don't know, it's just, I think anything you can do animation wise is going to help you in some way. Then again, if, you're, if your mechanics are not solid, I wouldn't dive into an acting piece because then you still struggle with mechanics when you just want to concentrate on performance. So whatever you do, if you have time and the opportunity to be structured, 
I would go with the principles, build on top of that, and really lean on body mechanics so that you're really good at them and then get, get into uh, acting pieces. But again, if you just want to kind of experiment and see how things are, you just want to try out some acting pieces, why not? Just know that you will have that, that extra problem of dealing with body mechanics. So like that. Anyway, hope that makes sense. Nilofar, I hope um, I pronounced your name correctly, but that this is okay as an answer, despite being so late. I hope you're okay. Moving on, the 3D fella writes here, can you get a job with a AAA studio while using while only using Blender? I don't know. I want to say yes, because I don't work in a AAA studio. I don't use Blender. And when I recorded this last week, the day before, I saw some stuff on Twitter where people were saying actually they had zero problems with Blender on their resume and only knowing Blender. And I don't know. My thing is probably yes, but I'm completely ignorant about this. So do not listen to me. 3D generalists versus specializing pros and cons. Well, I mean, it really depends what you want to do uh, and what your focus is. If you if you're if you're good at multiple things, right? The jack of all trades, master of none, something like that. Um, you have potentially a wider pool of job opportunities because you can do this, 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 and this. But if you are spread out in terms of where you put in your time to learn things, you might not be able to really master something specifically. So will you be able to advance in that area? So let's say you know multiple things, but kind of just okay, and you get an animation job, it might not just be enough to continue within that path of just animation. But again, you know multiple things, you can switch around. If an animation job ends, you might have a job as a lighting artist. I think it's good to know a bunch of stuff versus me. Uh, I only know animation barely. So I wish I could, I would know more. And by wishing, it just means I just need to take the time and, you know, make time to learn things. I just have too much sort of stuff going on. I, I don't know. I, just, I, I would love to know more um, for that reason, to have more of a, a job security type of thing. Then again, if you specialize, you know, if you really like animation, like I really like animation and I love specializing in just that, knowing whatever I can within that field, be it camera animation, creature animation, human animation, props and effects and all kinds of stuff. I just like that a lot, like performance and, and just mechanics. That is just really appealing to me. And I like specializing in that to be, to try to be really good at that. But I think the pros and cons are valid obviously on both sides. So I think it really comes down to what do you like and what works for you? Are you in an environment where, or somewhere where you have multiple job opportunities? So you know that, you know what, if I'm a generalist, I actually have more opportunities to pay my bills and to advance and know more. It's gonna be more fun meeting more people. Different companies are great. Or you are somewhere where that is not really a possibility job wise. And the, the companies that are around you are more specialized job opportunities. I think that's something for you again to consider. So it's a bit of a tricky thing. They both have their pros and cons. Um, I know it's a very general answer, but it's going to end up being whatever works best for you. Let's say it like that. Things to know <clears throat> when shooting reference footage. I'm going to link and blend in here my series about reference uh, and have something else coming up I want to talk about as a reference. But generally, things to know for me, it would be set up your space so that it really mimics your shot as in the camera angle, the props. Are you sitting at a table? Is your character at a table when you animate it? Well, then you should be sitting at a table as well. And if you're lifting something heavy, don't pretend, you know, I, I don't hold back in your reference because you want to see what it actually does to your body. If you lift, lift something heavy, um, if you talk to someone tall, put a tape somewhere on the wall so you look up. So to me, all that stuff is the closer you are with your reference to your final product, the less guessing you have, right? Um, so if you lift something heavy and you're just pretending to be like, you know, it's like an empty bag and it's kind of like, eh, then you're going to have that pretend footage of you lifting something heavy, which then to me, like, what's the point then? Um, so I would just stay, you know, be as true as you can to the final product. In terms of setup, acting wise, maybe you're more comfortable just acting things out generally and then pushing it uh, when you animate, pushing the poses, the timing and everything. Some people are really good at acting things out in a very cartoony way. So there's less changes to do or interpreting or anything. Some people should reference it and retime the reference 
to then use that as a guide for their animation. Like, there's just many ways that you can go about shooting reference. Again, like I said, to me, the setup should be as representative as you can, and then I would not hold back. As in, don't pretend, really go out with your energy. If your audio line has someone yelling, don't just mouth the words, but do yell, because it's gonna be different in your body, posture and language and everything, and, and, and how you move when you actually have that much energy coming out. Um, and I think that will be that. And many other things, but link in the description with more information. But I think that's kind of that. Just don't hold back, replicate as much as you can. Um, that was one more thing and I just escapes my brain. I might, I might remember as I continue this. Um, demo reel advice, same thing, link in the description, put in my, the series that I have about demo reels, which I'm gonna continue. The main thing will be best shot comps first and make sure that your work is tailored towards the company you are applying to for whatever English. Uh, so yes, so make sure that, you know, if you have something super photo real, that you don't send that to a cartoony company. It won't really work. And don't wait for people to, to, you know, don't think that they will watch the whole thing and then keep your best shot till the very end for this big reveal, because they might not have time. So best shot comes first. And that's kind of that. Yeah, I think so. Next up, we have Anna asking here, is there something you disagree with and or wish to change in the animation industry? Uh, yes, for sure. I mean, there's always something and this can be small to something really big. I mean, it really depends on what you need, what you, you know, what, what are your needs? What is your focus? What are the things you're missing? I can't really complain too much about my animation career so far. Um, you know, obviously I had a, a bunch of help from the very beginning, like my dad paid for school, right? So there's already like the financial hurdle of attending the Academy of Art, which is not cheap has been solved for me, which many other people, they don't have that opportunity. So then I would say access, access to learning material. This is why I'm doing the channel. Hopefully that it's helpful that I can just, you know, give people as much information as possible. But then also my information is in English. So maybe a better way to have all the material that I do neatly translated into other languages. It's my dog. Since this is a free flowing Q&A, where is he? Yeah, there is, there he is. Where's my finger there? Right there. That's indie. Anybody listening to this going, what is going on? But let me get up. I'm gonna cut this and pause this because I gotta close the door. Go okay, hold on. All right, unpause. Um, so yes, I think access to learning material and access in a way that, you know, as many people as possible can benefit from it. That would be one thing. Um, and that to me is kind of like, not on the lower end, but it, it's kind of like where it starts. Like you want to start learning about animation, how how do you go about it? Do you have, I mean, are you in a country that has the infrastructure to learn online? Are you in a country that has frequently their online access cut off for whatever social, political reasons? Like all that, there's so many things that are out, outside of my um, blinders where I can only talk about it, but I don't really have any experience with it. So, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of stuff you can disagree with really depending on it really depends on where you're from and your your point of view i mean just now since i recorded this last week this week the whole activision blizzard thing came up that's definitely something you want to change within the industry so again it really depends on where you are what what company the, what type of industry the people you're with there's always something so to me it would just be fair treatment access um you know enough possibilities to 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 succeed within a company um, enough access to be able to switch between companies without repercussions or problems or that's like the remote work is great because you know before that you have to move from city to city or maybe from country to country that's really that's a massive pain especially if you have family and kids so now that with the lockdown and you have or you know the the, the situation we're all in with the remote working has opened up so many possibilities i think that's great so stuff like that um to me is, is a huge benefit but again it really all depends on on um, yeah, what you need and what your what your problems are. So this, I think this is a, this is a question that would have so many topics to cover, and like a five hour Q and A. Um, but yeah, curious though what you think or people watching, like what you would what are your top three things you would like to change? Uh, yeah, I'm leave it at that. How do you plan your shots? For example, if you have seven days for a single shot, then how many days are you gonna spend for gathering references or doing research? And how many days are you gonna to give to execute the shot? And is there any do's and don'ts for the shots during tight deadlines? 
That's a good question. So how do you plan your shots? Me, I plan all in the head and, and filming reference. Because I can't really draw. I love to draw, as I always say. If you watch my stuff, you know what I'm saying. Uh, I love to draw, but I can't. My drawings confuse me. It's just I, I can't even do proper stick figures, which I really should change, given that I do feedback and I draw horribly on, on movies and clips. I, I have many, many how to draw books, and I'll, I'll get to it one day. But yes, I do plan in terms of my dogs falling asleep. I uh, plan in my head. I try to visualize as much as I can. And if there's no reference, then it's just in my head. I, so I, I don't start until I have a really good idea what I want to do. It helps me to fill myself in terms of ideas. That's what it was about the reference, going back. In your reference, going back to the previous question, don't just shoot like two or three takes, 10, 15, 20, 50 takes, whatever. Even if you have two hours worth of reference, it's going to be a pain to sort through it, but get everything out of your system. Like you're being too self-conscious about your timing and you in front of a camera. Let's get more relaxed, get everything out of your system. That was the extra thing I wanted to talk about for the reference. So same thing here. So when I plan, I do that. I shoot a lot of takes just to get all the ideas out. And I'm, it doesn't mean that I have to stick to the reference. Again, another answer to the previous question. Just because you shoot reference doesn't mean you should copy it 100% unless that's what the style is asking for. Sometimes you shoot a bunch of reference for more ideas or just for like, a small moment of knowing how the shoulder is going to interact with the elbow, with the push. You know, it, it, it can be a loose reference, but I try to do enough quote unquote homework before I start. Well, that means, and the good thing about working remote is that people don't see me working, is that sometimes I'm just sitting at my desk for hours, sometimes even a day. I'm just like this. As the plane goes over here, you hear the plane. I just say do nothing. And it, I felt bad because, you know, if people work by, back at ILM, I was right there where the hallway was. People walk, walk past me and they would just see me doing nothing. And uh, I was doing something, I was thinking about it, but I don't like to just jump into a shot without an idea, which sometimes you do have to, sometimes deadlines or the turnover comes in and this is due tomorrow, two days, whatever. Sometimes you just gotta go in there really fast. But ideally, if you can, if I can, I'd like to have a plan and an idea and however I get to that is, is what you should try. So you, in your case, meaning that maybe you need thumbnails, maybe you need, you better at drawing things out, maybe you prefer acting things out, maybe you can do all in your head, but that's what I do here. Um, you're saying here, for example, if you have a seven days for a single shot, so I'm gonna spend, if I can, a day. Again, this is really dependent on the deadline and what you have to do in your shot. Sometimes you got 10 minutes, sometimes your planning is as you get your turnover and you, you hear the notes, you see maybe the animatics and then you go, okay, walk back to your desk and let's go. Or sometimes you have time, so I spend, hopefully I can a day, sometimes half a day, really depends on, on again, on, on the deadlines. Um, and then how many days to execute the shot. Well, how many days I can, as much as I can. As in, some shots are due like two days, three days, five days, two weeks, a month, it really depends. What I have been doing, and since I've been, I'm recording all of this again, I don't know if I'm answering this and that's ahead of another question, but basically um, what I do at work now is that I go for final every time I animate. That doesn't mean I'm gonna do a crazy facial finger stuff, but I try to, but it really all depends also on the time. You mean like it's, you have a shot and I don't wanna do something rough because then there's more guessing work. Like, oh, how is this going to be? And maybe they want to show the shot quickly to the client. I'm just at this point where I go as fast as I, as I can while keeping the quality up, meaning mechanics are there, hopefully solid, camera work, whatever you need. And if there's time, extra stuff, fingers, face, detail, whatever, just in case you can go for blocking plus or some smaller shots for final. And then it's basically the client likes it and you just hear, you know, final plus cleanup, like whatever you want to call it, the dirty final, the CVB, whatever you guys call it, whatever, whatever company. But that's kind of my goal is to show as much as I can while making sure that the most important things are addressed first. So I'm not going to do something really rough in the body, but then have super detailed finger poses. It's not that. Like you do the best you can with the most important sections first. But if there's time, I go and do more just in case you never know. And actually that helped me a lot on the last show I was on before I left uh, ILM was Boba Fett. And it was a bigger sequence that we were all able to do. And there were some bigger shots, I can't say what it was, obviously what about uh, what it is that I was doing, but some of them were also smaller because it was a longer sequence with like story shots, not, not like demo reel shots or something big. But every now and then you got shorter shots in between. 
And for those, like, why not? Why not go full on and polish and then show the whole thing? And then you just know you're going to get notes on the bigger shot because then it might need changes or just more polish. And the smaller shots are pretty much numb. So that's kind of how I approach things. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and is there a do's and don'ts for shots during tight deadlines? Um, do's and don'ts, good question. What I do during tight deadlines is that I do two things. I trust my gut in terms of let's just not go with the first idea. You want to ruminate, like you want to take your idea and then iterate on that and make the idea as original as you can and more creative. So don't just go with the first thing that comes to mind. But at the same time, sometimes you run about of, out of time, right? I just try to go with this sounds cool in the context of what the show is. How to explain that. So if I get a shot, I go, this would be cool. It wouldn't, it wouldn't just be me looking at the shot in the vacuum where I go, oh, this would be cool for the shot. You have to look at what happened before and what's going to happen afterwards. What is the show? What is the style? You know, is it Star Wars, something Marvel? Whatever you do, whatever company, whatever style you have in content, you look at what would be something that fits this world, this movie, this sequence, this character, and then base all of your awesome ideas, hopefully, on that. So it's not just all a single thing that you might want to put in there. It needs to work within the, the, you know, the bigger context. And then, if possible, I shoot reference because if, if I'm on the really tight deadline, it's easier for me to shoot reference and then take that reference, put that into Maya and rotoscope it. People might go, as always, rotoscope, what, creativity, gone, cheating, whatever. I don't care. For me, it's, I want to know if my idea fits the character in terms of the scale, the look of the character, how the character moves within the scene. What if there's a match move? There's an actual real camera. Is my acting and my movement fitting the camera move? Am I in sync? Am I leading the camera? Am I behind the camera? I just want to know if those ideas will work in the greater context of the shot. So scale, the asset, the camera, the surrounding, maybe audio cues. Maybe there's an audio line from the actor in the scene. And I don't want to, I don't want to guess. So I want to take my ideas and get them as fast as I can into the shot. And if it's something for the real, then we're just reference and not really a problem. And then if it doesn't, then I can reshoot reference or try something else. Or you can get really rough version of your blocking lab that way. And then you can show it to your leader soup and then they can decide. It's just to me, I want to be as fast as I can in order to present as many ideas as possible, if that makes sense, regardless of how I get there. Is this all keyframe imagination? Is it keyframe based on thumbnails, keyframe based on reference, copying reference, rotoscoping reference, like, or taking mocap? It doesn't matter to me. Whatever gets the job done as fast as possible, with the highest quality possible to present as many ideas as possible. If I could summarize it like that, that's my, that's my approach currently. Um, because I am working for someone, someone else's deadline, they have their budget, they have their schedule. So I have to kind of, you know, take a step back in terms of what would I like to do? What would I prefer to do? Would it be all out of my imagination and keyframes? So it's all me for ego, whatever. It doesn't really matter. So I, I put that aside and I, I want to work in a specific way to be as good as possible, as fast as possible. When I do things at home, I do things a bit differently, um, but not by much. But anyway, that's kind of that. Hope that helps. All right, a couple questions here. How to work as an independent artist? I don't know. I am not one. How will we get work? I don't know. How will we earn from it? I don't know either. <laughs> what is most challenging to work as an independent artist or to work in a studio? Again, I don't know. Uh, but I will link a description. I thought I saw someone, I gotta find that. I actually had problems last week remembering that as well. Um, the couple um, YouTube animators who they've done a couple of clips about freelance independent stuff, I'll find it. Um, and if it's not linked today, I will find it and then check back in the description in maybe a couple of days. Uh, I will find it. Um, I can only answer the second part. What's the most challenging to work in a studio? I would say deadlines. When it comes to work, the thing is, what's the most challenging work, right? To me, when I say deadlines, it seems kind of ridiculous when thinking about the Activision Blizzard situation, for instance, right now, because I'm, it's all over Twitter right now. So that seems like a petty thing, like, oh, deadlines, ooh, because that's part of work. You know what I mean? And I say this because there are people that have many other problems that are much more challenging and that can be in terms of harassment, in terms of workplace, 
problems and, and limiting in terms of advancing a career that are so much more um, kind of holding you back and, and more mentally taxing than a deadline. You know what I mean? So again, what is the most challenging? It really depends on who you are and where you work and what your needs are. Again, for me, I've been super lucky in my, in my time at ILM. It's been really, really great. So that's why my answer is deadlines because the people that I'm, I was surrounded with, they were great. It's always fun. We always laugh. There's no real, like, you know, like political or like coworker problems. I know it's been, there's always something that comes up, right? There's always going to be someone that does something weird or someone that treats you weird, not in a harassing way, but it's like, really, did you just have to say that? Like there's sometimes typical job situations because we're all humans and we're going to have conflict. This is how it goes. But it's nothing where I would go, I quit, I'm out. So for me, it's more, how can I deliver the best work possible under deadlines where you wish you had more time, but then you don't, you just have one day or two or whatever it is. So I think it's, it's being able to do the best you can within all the limitations. I had to cut that out. I was coughing, <clears throat> but again, this sounds completely separate from issues that other people have that are much more challenging, much more um, concerning. So it really, again, depends on, on where you're at and, and what you're faced with. It's kind of a super subjective. What kind of challenges or difficulties you face when you work as an independent artist? That's the last question again. I don't know. I have zero experience as an independent artist. I have been full-time uh, staff at ILM for 17 and a half years. So I have massive blinders when it comes to the outside world of switching companies. I've only switched to one other company. Now I'm starting uh, Warner Brothers next week. So I'm learning a bunch of stuff about unions and contracts and negotiating and, and negotiating English, all kinds of stuff. So that will be more fuel for this channel that I can talk about in Q and A's, but there are some other things that I have zero experience with. Um, so yes, so I'm going to continue with this other question here. It's a long one. Let me read this whole thing. Could you please help us how to plan properly and precisely? Kind of goes back to what I said before. To me, it's just having a really clear vision of what you want to do. And in order to plan that precisely for me is thinking about an idea and really brainstorming this idea as much as possible, going through revisions. Is this an idea that's pushed enough? Is this an idea that really works within the context of the character, the sequence, the movie, or whatever you work on, TV show, whatever. Um, and then either, what do you need? Maybe you draw. Again, for me, I shoot reference, I film, uh, or I find reference online. So that's kind of, how I work and hopefully that's an answer to your question. That's how I plan properly and precisely. And also just to throw that out there, sometimes I can do all that stuff and then I start the shot and it's, and it's horrible. All my planning, nothing really ended up working. So I either start over or I try to fix it as I animate and then shoot reference later for something else or I wing the whole thing and kind of, kind of come up with stuff on the spot. It's not always just because you can plan properly and precisely doesn't mean that everything's going to go according to plan. It might start off great and you might get notes from, from a client and then the notes change everything. And now you're running out of time to shoot proper reference or to plan more. And then it's more catching up until you get to the deadline. So just try to plan as much as you can. I mean, you know, the way, whatever, however it works for you and a quick little edit because I ran out of a uh, recording there. It stops after half an hour. Um, so it's going to say, Try to plan as much as you can, but know that your plan is going to change. So you are in a creative environment. You can plan as much as you want to, but people are going to have more ideas and it's going to, it's going to go in a different way. It's never going to go as planned. Just be ready for that. How to use video reference exactly. How can we add things to it or remove parts of it? So again, reference what I said before, but generally, I mean, I'm going to read the rest because it's all kind of the same thing. I mean, should the video reference be the exact reference we want or is it not necessary? We can change it. I use the combination of video reference and thumbnails. Thumbnail and key poses are easy, but extreme poses like contacts, direction changes are hard to draw because you need to be precise to show the extremes. You know what I mean? It's hard to explain. In summary, it's hard for me to change video reference and don't know how to do it exactly. Any help would be appreciated. All right. So again, yes, you can absolutely change and remove things. So. The way you would look at a reference is that it's an initial guide and that can set you, you know, it's a good beginning to start, but it doesn't mean that your reference only, only has to be at the very beginning of your process. You can shoot reference. It's going to be awesome. You animate and now you can polish 
Shoot reference again. You need extra detail for fingers, for facial stuff, for close-ups. You can shoot reference and look at reference at any point of your process for any kinds of reasons. General blocking for body mechanics, something close up for again, face or fingers or contact points or whatever. So don't feel limited that the process is filming reference at the beginning and then that's it. Absolutely not. You can use reference whenever you want to. And in terms of changing things, just look at whenever you shoot reference, it's going to be, is it going to be a springboard for something that you want to use later on or that's kind of you want to base your action on? Or is it going to be something super precise that you want to stick to because you need to because of the content, someone that told you to, the style, whatever it is. I think you, you have to make changes to make the shop better. That's like such a general stupid thing to say. <laughs> it's What I'm trying to say is that you shoot reference, at least I can only explain it the way I do it. I shoot reference in terms of ideas. It gives me an opportunity to try things out. If I like something over the process of shooting reference, because I don't shoot reference, you know, three, five takes and that's it. I shoot a bunch of takes over a long period of time. And then it's the, it's the later takes that are gonna be the ones I'm gonna use because as I'm filming, I'm realizing that's not good. Oh, that's a good idea. I like this now. And then my new take will incorporate all those ideas. But that's kind of, I'm, I'm still fairly general in my, in my acting and my quote unquote performance, which, you know, I'm not saying I'm a performer here. But then when I animate, I will take that and stylize it and, and do a character of that or just really push that moment. And I'm not huge, I'm not really good at acting things out the way it's going to end up being in the, uh, for where the shot I'm doing in terms of like cartoony acting and snappy timing. I prefer to do something more general more naturalistic and real. So I can see kind of, oh, I like this, I like that. But then I take that moment and then I stylize that once I animate it. I know some people do the opposite. They, they act things out and it's super cartoony. They look at the camera and then their acting is all like nicely silhouetted. So they have less to do once they put that onto their shot. It really all depends how you work um, and what is easier for you. But generally you can change things and move things whenever you want to. It doesn't matter when, it's whatever, whatever helps you. Um, and you don't know, if you don't know what to change, just look at what is the essence of the shot? What is the most important part of your reference? And everything else is just kind of extra, right? Is it, are you looking for a specific mechanics? Um, are you looking for a specific move, a specific acting moment, a specific look or head turn? Or, you know, let's say you're going for like weight and you actually pick up something really heavy and you're lifting the thing. Maybe the main essence is that you just want to portray the timing of weight and how your body goes from, you know, hunched over to uh, stretching and then bring it up there. And that's all you want to concentrate on. So you are not looking at the feet at all in terms of are, are my toes doing all kinds of things? What, what kind of shifts do I have in my ankles? Maybe none of that is important. Maybe just it's just the essence of how do I show this to be heavy without extra detail? I, I would look at it in those terms. Like, what are you really looking for? Um, in your reference in terms of what is needed to keep. I hope that makes sense. I don't know. Well, again, it feels like it's rambly. Hope it helps. Uh, there's this guy. This is an account called this guy. He says, or she said, I don't know. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Since it's a guy. Sorry, sorry, sorry. One more last question. How do you give breath and settle to a character, especially when we have like four to five frames? That's a good question. <laughs> that is a tricky thing. You only have four to five frames. I think what I would do really depends on the shot. I don't know. It's a hard question to answer, but I would say if you have a settle or a hold, whatever it is, whatever you do, especially with such a short period of time, I would think in terms of what is important to the audience, like what does the audience have to focus on? So let's say if you do like a, and you hold, I'm not even gonna talk about your breath. Like say, let's say a hold and your audience needs to look at the face. I wouldn't do much in the moving hole in terms of what this arm is doing off screen. Like it's, for me, it's off screen, but imagine that's on screen for you to see. Because then the audience might look down and miss what's in the face. So if you do a, a settle, then you're gonna have to have something where it's not distracting from the focus, if that makes sense. Same thing with, with the breathing. But again, four to five frames, you can't do much. I mean, or, I mean, you know, really depends on the breath. Um, there's not much you can squeeze in in four to five frames. So it all comes down to the quintessential essence of that moment. Is the settle and the breathing something because of 
being out of breath, hunched over, so you can just do one <gasps> big like, chest inhale. Is it somewhere like <laughs> something like that, where it's in the face and you do mostly nostril stuff and, and closed mouth? You mean like there, there are different ways of how to show breathing. And I would look at what is the most important way to show it in terms of focus and what the audience needs to see. Again, I hope that makes sense. Because you don't have time over four to five frames. So you have to pick something that is readable without being distracting and that tells the story and serves the character. Again, it seems like very broad in terms of an answer, but it's the best I can do. Um, at least that's how I would approach it, more so than, well, over four frames, maybe do a, like a, you know, two frame inhale and the three frame exhale. So that at least it's not mirrored and it's not the same. I wouldn't approach it that way. Obviously there are many answers I could give you in terms of technical things, but to me, none of that matters because it's all the technical things are driven by the intent of the character and what is what needs to be clear in the shot to the audience. Hope that makes sense. What should I do? Animation challenge or animation exercises? And I replied as in an online competition versus your own home exercises. And this was 11 months ago and I never saw a reply. <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, I'm just going to answer this generally. What should I do? Animation challenge or animation exercise? Both. That is my answer. Why? Because if you do animation exercises, let's say you do them at home, and this is why I was asking here. So if you do stuff at home, you have no deadline. So you can dilly dally, you can noodle, you can waste a lot of time going through some something where no one tells you final or you run out of time or something. So, but it gives you the freedom to try stuff. And that's why I like home exercises. You can pick and choose. You are your own clients. You got your own revisions. You might show it to other people, but it's kind of, you're free to explore stuff, which is really cool. The downside is you might get lost in having no deadlines. Um, I really thrive on deadlines. If I have an open end, um, I'm slower. <laughs> the more I have to do, and with a tighter deadline, the more my brain goes into how do I divide it into this, this, and this, and how can I be as efficient as possible to get this all done? Versus you have one thing to do over six months, I'm gonna do it during the last week. I'm horrible at that. Versus an animation challenge, you got a deadline. That's the massive pro where you know whatever you're going to do, you have to hit that deadline. And that's why I would do both. It's fun to explore things at home without a deadline. And at the same time, sometimes it's just really important to be able to come up with a cool idea and good animation, quote unquote, good, whatever, within a certain amount of time. Because you're always going to be fighting deadlines if you're going to work for someone, if that makes sense. So it's, it's good practice to come up with something and do good work um, under a, a time limit. So yes to both. Have you ever received feedback on your work that made you feel like a horrible animator? What was the feedback? Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you the feedback because it would be work related and I'm not going to talk about work, clients and stuff, confidential, but no, a horrible animator. No, but the thing is I question my animation skills on my own already <laughs> all the time, every day. There's always this thing of when I start a shop, like I might have a great idea in my mind. Great. And then I start and then it's horrible. And then I realize, okay, today is the day where they're going to realize I can't really do all the things that I'm pretending that I'm able to do English again. I don't know if that made sense. And then as I continue through either looking at what people have done within the sequence or my previous work on that show or generally or feedback in dailies, there always comes a point where it's going to be okay. You get to a point where there has been enough feedback and you've gone through enough of the crappy blocking where it ends up being, oh, it's actually not that bad. And then hopefully it can be better than just not that bad. It can be good and, and great. But I think to me, I always question things all the time. And especially when you do something new. After all this time, you know, there comes a point where you're very used to certain actions and it's you kind of rely on almost muscle memory in terms of, oh, this is why it works and this is how the graph it is going to look like. But you will always encounter something where it's going to, going to question your your skills in a way. Um, so I don't really need someone to tell me that I'm horrible. <laughs> I'm already questioning that on my own. And in terms of clients, I mean, again, I'm not going to talk about clients, um, but thinking about it, no, no. I'm really thinking, I'm actually thinking about it. Did I ever get feedback from someone, be it within work, 
made me feel like a horrible animator. No, it's more like, it's more like me realizing I didn't do enough in terms of this is really, this was back on Narnia where there was a something about a post change. And I think I said that before in one of my Q and A's or something. I feel like I'm repeating the story, but short, uh, short story is basically I was supposed to change something, which I did, but I spent all the time in my, in my perspective view, tumbling around the camera, looking around, now, this is different. And I didn't check in off the render view. And then I rendered, showed it to the lead and the lead just flipped the image, like in terms of old version, new version. And I literally, it looked like I just moved like two pixels. And this was hours of work. And the look was really, did you really do any work? <laughs> and he wasn't that mean. He just, he just had that funny look and, and uh, he was totally right. It looked horrible in terms of me doing nothing, but I did do stuff. So it's not like it made me feel like a horrible animator, but it was more of a, it was embarrassing and a, another reminder and check mark or, or like a list of things that are now in my head when I present things. Did I go through this? Did I check that? Did I, uh, you know, address these notes? Like after all those years, you just have a mental checklist of what you should do and not do before you present. Um, so yeah. yeah, I hope that makes sense. What are main animation exercises I should do to learn body mechanics and acting in animation? Well, these are different things. So what I would do, it's a good question. For body mechanics, I think it would be complex actions and weight. So anything where you can start off with like a sit down, or getting up and then the jump in place to jump over something, jump from low to high, high to low, anything where it's, there is a, a weight shift or like a weight transfer, be it from like, you know, standing to walking, or walking to a stop, like all that stuff, weight transfer, momentum, and just general weight, I think is really complicated and difficult to pull off. That's what I would focus on. And then you can extrapolate and, and do outside force onto your characters. You could be standing and someone pushes you and you got that tumble or, or for whatever reason you do tumble. So I think stuff like that to me, yeah, that's what I would, that's what I would focus on. Like learning weight, weight transfer, shifting, um, more so than like an arm gesture. You know I mean like that and just the general concept of if you, as I'm thinking that I'm doing this arm gesture, whenever you move something, that body part is going to influence the rest of the body. So I would practice those things while always keep in mind that if I move my arm up, it's going to move my shoulder up. And because of that shoulder move and this, you can see my chest is moving as well. But I want to keep talking to the camera, for instance, and I move, I do this, I'm going to counter with my head to stay stabilized and, you know, addressing the camera like that. So if you do like a big head wave, like this, I think it's seen in like um, Forrest Gump. I don't know why Forrest Gump jumps in my brain right now, but Forrest Gump, he has like, eh, like a, he waves before he jumps into the, I can't remember, something like that. And you look at this and if you do like a big dramatic wave, you're going to have the movement in the elbow that's going to move your arm. And because of that, it's going to move your chest around. That's going to have some head wiggle. I mean, all that stuff is, uh, there's going to be always something influencing the rest of the body. I think that that's what I will keep in mind when you do anything body mechanics, or anything generally, right? In animation and acting in animation. Um, what I would say there as like a general answer, make sure well, that's no, that's a tip. It's not a main exercise. Well, how about this? Find exercises or make a list of exercises where your character is reacting and thinking before acting. If that makes sense. Because you want to show thought process. Otherwise, you just then it just becomes movement. If the character is not thinking or we're not seeing that the character is processing something and then reacting to something, it just it won't feel as alive as it could be. Then it just feels like you're going through the motions. So that would be my advice so for animation exercise for for acting it would be even like simple stuff where a character just sits there and then you have outside influence like stimuli where it's like audio or something popping up and the character's going whoa or maybe like a sign pops up and the character reads and then has a reaction just you want to really practice that like give your character time to see process and react yeah hope that makes sense Checking my camera here. What is this? 60 minutes? All right. Battery's dead though, but it's connected. Anyway, stuff will break eventually. My Q&As are cursed, by the way. There's always something breaking. For VFX animation, should the focus be creature animation and realistic movements? Sure. And camera. 
Uh, for sure creature. I mean, it's always going to be creature stuff, but also human. You might have to do a digital stunt double. Um, yes, realistic movements, because usually VFX means your whatever you're doing will be next to a human, or at least within a, a live action environment. So everything has to um, fit the physics and that world. So yes, it will end up being more realistic than stylized. Um, and I would also focus on animation for cameras because you might have to do previs or post vis or animatics uh, or an actual shot that's all CG and you got to make it all photo real, including the camera movement, the handheld, the lensing, all that stuff. So yes, yes and more. That's my answer to Isaac. What are best websites to find animation job? Um, it's a good question. Uh, Self-servingly, I would say my YouTube channel. <laughs> Uh, during the animation minute, my Monday news thing, I try to round up all the animation um, job postings that I can find. Um, that would be one place. Um, but generally, I get these from LinkedIn. LinkedIn, if you follow the right people and the right companies, and by right, I mean the ones that serve you, like whatever you're interested in, those companies, they post job listings all the time. Um, so I would look at that. Then I would look at um, Twitter. People post stuff there all the time as well. And um, I can LinkedIn, you can fill something out where you can write down what your interests are, what kind of jobs or job types. And then you get email newsletters like this one called Holly List. I have all kinds of stuff coming in where they tell you, you know, animation positions or animation assistant or animation supervisor within where you, you designate it to be in terms of what city, what country. Um, so that's super helpful there as well. Um, and as always, I'm always forgetting and someone always replies or, or lets me know. And I should really write this down and put that in a saved folder. There is someone that keeps a, uh, uh like an Excel sheet, a Google doc with all the, um, game development jobs, like just game related jobs as well. So yeah, LinkedIn for sure. And Twitter. These are my two go-to places for job posting. How to animate realistic and cartoony body mechanics? Um, it's a good question. Well, in a way, again, this goes back to the whole reference discussion that we had before, or we had that I was rambling about. But you can shoot reference and not stylize your movements where it's you just move the way you move realistically. And if you use, and if that's your, your beginning for realistic uh, body mechanics, then you're, you're fairly set because you can see how things move realistically. And if you go into cartoony body mechanics, then again, you will take the, the essence of what you just did, like the main idea, and then take that and then stylize that and caricature that. So it fits the style of your cartoony mechanics, right? Because cartoony can be somewhat naturalistic cartoony to like super snappy one frame post changes. So it really kind of depends. And then, uh, you know, if you're like in hotel T land, um, <laughs> your reference might just be really rough because it's so stylized that you're just gonna have to look at well, my, my, the essence of their mechanics is that when I, again, because I'm sitting, I'm sitting down and I'm, let's say, let's say I'm tired and I sit down and I know that if I do this, I plop down and I got some head overlap and my shoulder pops up before I settle. And maybe that's all you take from your photo reel reference that was real. But, oh, I like this idea of collapse and shoulder spike. And maybe that's the pa -pa, like something that you take uh, into your shot. So yes, so how to animate realistic and car cartoony body mechanics. Um, it would be, and I say re um, reference because that's how I plan things, but maybe your planning is um, all just through thumbnails and then you just rely a lot on your sense of timing. Because the thing is, the difference between realistic and cartoony body mechanics is how much you stylize and caricature a certain moment and that will be visible through timing. So really look at how far can you push the timing so it still tells a story, but it really reduced everything to, to its essence. I just like saying essence. Um, so yes, that would be my, my generalized answer, um, to that. There's more to say, but I think, yeah, I'm gonna leave it at that. How to animate early season cartoony body mechanics. Um, cause the thing is even cartoony body mechanics still have to be based on functioning real world mechanics. And I don't mean that, you know, when like Roadrunner goes off the, the cliff and floats in, in the air and then falls clearly in cartoon land, you can bend gravity and rules and all kinds of stuff. That's not what I mean. But if you have, if you have a character and that's my thing is always for mechanics and for my students is that if you take it, if you do a side shift or a side step and you go from this to this and you want to go the other way, 
if your body momentum goes this way, the only way you can change direction is either by someone pushing you the other way, you have your hand out, you pull yourself over there, or your leg that's pointed this way can push me this way, if that makes sense. So if you are completely off balance, how are you gonna be able to move the other way? So if you take that wrong off balance pose and you put that into a cartoony animation, then it has to be really cartoony in terms of, I'm so off balance that I can now stretch my leg out and that leg does like a twirl or gets extra long for that change or, or you're off balance and you do like a big anticipation with your arm that then snaps you over. I mean, you can cheat and bend the rules and be super cartoony to go you know, around those limitations. But if you're not realistic, if you're not, not realistic, if you're not successful in that, it's still gonna look wrong, if that makes sense, right? So you still have to look at proper posing and balance and weight shifts. And of course, the more, you know, the, the cartoonier, the stylized, the more stylized you get, the more you can go around this and make it absolutely crazy. But if we talk about, you know, for some people, realistic uh, or cartoony animation, it says Disney. Disney's for sure cartoony, but it's not super pushed like all the stuff you can see on, on there, uh, on there as in like my screen, um, in theaters or on TV or whatever. So for let's say Disney animation, you still have to look at proper balance versus cartoony TV shows can really go around that, like around that, you know, limitation of what it's supposed to be when you, let's say, change direction. It's very rambly, very rambly, but I hope that makes sense. Basically, my whole Q&A, the umbrella around this. I hope this makes sense. How long is the deadline for a big studio like Pixar or whatever? I don't know Pixar. I don't work there, but I can tell you the whatever part. <laughs> uh, the, the, actually, I don't have an answer because the, the answer is it depends, which is always the, the complete BS answer. Um, I don't know. It depends. You're, you know, how long is the deadline? A deadline could be five hours, could be a day, could be two days, could be five days, could be a month. It really all depends on the complexity uh, on the schedule. You might have something really complex. And at the beginning of the show, you got enough time, like a week or two. And then at the end of the show, you only have three days. <laughs> it really depends. It depends on where you're at in your cycle of the show and uh, the complexity of the shot. And it's, I can't really, unfortunately, answer. How about this? How long is the deadline? Always too short. Hi, Gene. It's Johnny or Jay. I was wondering, what is your opinion on social media as a way to distribute ideas and animations, as a way to promote oneself? Do you have any advice on how to approach this? Is it worth it to pursue pursuit an internet presence as an independent animator? Thanks. Uh, good question, because again, I, I don't do independent animation, so I can't really answer that. I'm checking my phone because my wife just called, but I don't see a text. Maybe it's not that important. I'm sure it's totally important. It's probably about lunch. Um, I think self-promotion nowadays, I mean, all depends how comfortable you are with this. Like I spam my Twitter account incessantly every day with workshop critiques. Like when I post something on YouTube, I post it on my on my Twitter feed. And then I post, I post it on my blog as well. And that blog is usually a couple hours later. And that gets an automatic tweet as well. And then the next day I tweet in case you missed it, either just a YouTube link or like a short clip. And this could be, I could be posting about one YouTube clip three or four times on my account. And for some people, they still miss everything. <laughs> like, oh, I didn't know you did this. And I'm sure a lot of people go like, really, again? You just, you just never know who sees what at what point. It's probably less than you think. Whenever I think this is probably too much and I should stop, it's probably only reaching 2% of the people that I would like it to see. I don't know, that's kind of, you just never know. So any advice on how to approach this? I think social media is, is really great for visibility. Like for me, I love it just because I, f I have a very curated Twitter um, and Instagram feed where it's just, it's just very specific artists. And it, it's so helpful because it's every time I open Twitter, I'm not following news or whatever that gives me the drama or the conflict or just the horrible stuff that goes on in this world. I'm also, I'm, I'm consciously avoiding and creating a very, you know, very, uh, um, what's the word? Like the blindfolded, but a, like a, a blinder or a very narrow view of what's going on in the world. Because I'm always seeing something either through trending things or people that retweet stuff 
but I try to keep my feed educational for myself. It's very selfish, where I look at people's work, um, there could, could be movie news, animation news, um, demo reels, like I like that stuff. It's like, it's like an, another constant stream of education for me. And then that goes the other way. So for you as an artist, you can promote yourself in, in, in whatever way you see fit. So this could be a very honest, truthful, you know, depiction of who you are or super curated where you just leave out everything except your work, oh, whatever you want to do. But I think it's very, it's definitely helpful. And I think you can see this with people like Kevin Perry, where they have a massive falling and a massive amount of job opportunities because they have left their job. They're now full-time either TikTok or Instagram or Twitter, or all of them or LinkedIn. I think all of that can only be helpful. That would be my, my main answer. And I'm seeing my camera, uh, it's gonna cut off again. It's already 27 minutes, okay. Um, yeah, so I think it's a great way to distribute ideas. At the same time, the moment you distribute something, whatever it is, be ready for feedback and uh, unwanted feedback, rude feedback. Um, that's just the downside of anything when you present something to someone else that you don't know. They don't know, they don't know you, they don't know how you present things, they don't know the context of why you're posting this. And sometimes you get a comment that you don't really care about or that are just really wrong take on things or rude, like all kinds of stuff. So just be, be ready for that. There's always the pros and cons. Um, yeah, and then just you have to weigh in your options. Is this something that is going to be helpful to you? Do you need this for uh, job hunting, for promotion, to um, you know show a new product that you worked on, highlighting other people? It's all that is you know, pros and cons. I can say that the new job that I'm going to, I got because of social media. From what I hear, I'm gonna dig deeper once, once I start, is that someone saw my YouTube channel. They saw my acting analysis stuff. They liked that, checked on LinkedIn, and I had my badge open to work, and then contacted me, and now I got a new job. It's it's literally through YouTube. YouTube and then LinkedIn, and I got a job. So I'm definitely going to um, say yes to social media as, as being a, a great way to promote yourself. That opens up opportunities. But again, your your mileage may uh, vary, and it depends what you need and where you're from, and and you know your access to all that, and it's very subjective and, and individual. So is it worth it? Really depends on your list of pros and cons. And if there are too many cons, maybe it's not worth it to you. For me, yes. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people know. So it's it's unfortunately not something I can answer for you. I can only tell you what how it has been for me. Okay. Uh, and then one more question, but... I'm out, I'm gonna pause this. Oh, I, I unpaused it. And hopefully that didn't trigger the whole cable thing. I should probably redo my whole cabling system. Anyway, I hope this is not, but, oh, it's not squeaking. <laughs> Rough with this. I got my second mic here and this is still recording. An hour and seven minutes, I see. Last question, actually. I like to know your opinion. How much do coronavirus damage the CG industry? I'm planning to move to other company, but I'm not sure if I can find new job. In my country, Thailand, things not change much, but I'm afraid that some companies may already have financial damage. Sorry for bad English. Don't be sorry, it's not your second, it's your second language, it's not your first language. So anybody speaking multiple languages, don't apologize. It's already more than one and it's not easy. Um, it's a good question and I, I can't really answer that question. First of all, because I'm not in Thailand, like, I don't know. I don't know what's affecting you there and how things are there. I don't even know what's going on in Switzerland or France. Like so you can kind of see it through news and stuff, and it's even kind of hard to know what's going on in the States. I think all I can say is the, the change that we've all been going through since 2020 is that there has been a massive shift to working from home. So like the damage could be in terms of like live action shoots. Like there's, it's either delayed, uh, canceled or they might start and then someone gets, you know, gets it and then they have to pause the shoot. I think in terms of live action plus CG industry, there is a, a delay and a change in, in production schedules. And I'm sure with that comes always financial damage. I mean, that's kind of, if you don't have your job lined up and it's being delayed, then you don't get paid. You can't pay your bills. You're always going to have damage like that. When I take CG industry and I think in terms of animation, I think if you look around the news and what's going on, I don't think there's ever been as much animation uh, work like that in, in years. I mean, it's Netflix is pumping stuff out left and right. 
like every day you see news about uh either like netflix opens up something in la with an additional thing marvel's doing their mini studio for more animation of what i'm seeing in the news there or uh like a movie or a tv show i think there's a, some season of a, some tv show that is finishing but all animated instead of live action i think right now animation is really flourishing because of the situation we're in so in terms of job opportunities i think it's a great time and combined with remote working my dog is snoring. I don't know if you can hear this, but his little feetsies are, are waving. It's really cute. Anyway, you can't see him, but no. But anyway, um, so I think, again, pros and cons. I'm sure, for sure, it has done some damage. And at the same time, there's also good stuff that came out of it. Like the remote working, access to people, that the, pe the access that people have now because of this, in terms of working for a company that they can't because of either disabilities or they can't go there in terms of moving there. Like It has opened up so many opportunities I think that's great and at the same time yeah like there will be you know projects that have been delayed or canceled and that always comes with financial damage um but that's within the area that I'm in and what I'm seeing I can't really say um what's going on in Thailand and, and, and other companies so I don't know again this is kind of a non-answer um all I can say it has definitely changed things um yeah that's all I can say I mean look at like the Mandalorian, it definitely has helped stagecraft and production with that and, and realizing, oh, there's some really good work you can do with this that can be safer. You don't have to go on a location. I'm not saying it's better. I'm sure like real sunlight and wind and all that stuff you can fake, but then sometimes you can really tell when it's real. Uh, but, you know, it, again, it gives access. I don't know, like to me, it's like lots of pros and cons um, within that industry. I'm not talking in terms of general... Um, problems that last year and this year have, have caused in people's lives. Again, I'm, I'm talking very narrow-minded CG industry uh, perspective here. But that's kind of that. Um, yeah, I hope that was helpful. And I'm moving forward. That's it. 16. That's it for that. I'm going to do... I think that's the last one on my channel. More planes. Um, there's going to be another part for sure because I have, in the meantime, the more comments on my Q and A's. So I'm gonna combine those new questions. And then I have questions from, I believe LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram that I haven't addressed yet. So this is a very long running series. And then I'll probably you know, do another one where I go questions and we'll do it all over again. Cause I'm sure things have changed. More questions, new questions, new people joining. Uh, this will never end. And I'm always happy to just, you know, ramble on. Um, hopefully this wasn't too rambly and I will cut this whole thing together. Hopefully it won't be too, too messy this tells me uh yeah it's definitely gonna be an hour ish something like that so if you're actually listening to this till the very end thank you so much if you're watching this you got nothing else to do thank you again for your patience um maybe you liked all those answers and you want to see more of what i do that's when i go in with the pitch um like and subscribe the usual youtube pitch um and that's kind of that i don't know it's kind of that so i'll say thank you i'm gonna stop rambling and leave you be and maybe i'll see you in my next upload and um, if not thanks for joining once um have a great life and uh, that's that all right thanks